Well, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Sally McRae. Sally McRae is the Director of Nutrition and Dietetics at the Mata Health in Brisbane. Mata Health includes adult, maternity, and pediatric, public and private hospitals across three Brisbane campuses. I had the honor and great pleasure to work with Sally when we went live with room service in Australia in 2013, I believe it was. I got to go over there a few times and enjoy the beautiful city and the river walk that she was talking about. And to be able to work with Sally and her team, as well as the food service team. And when we first launched um, room service in Australia, it was, it was a great experience. And Sally's passion and hard work ethic and her heart for serving others is apparent in all that she's involved in. And she's involved in a lot. Sally's love for research and most specifically clinical benefits of food service models as they relate to patients' nutritional intake is her current focus. She holds an honorary adjunct assistant professor position with the Faculty of Health Sciences and Medicine at the University of Queensland and is an honorary fellow at the Mata Research Institute, the University of Queensland, Australia. Sally's current research is focused on a balanced scorecard model in regards to measuring and documenting the benefits of room service, and she is currently pursuing the question, is room service the new treatment to help manage malnutrition? Sally also loves to travel the world, and one of her favorite trips is to Cambodia and Vietnam to do um, support cancer funding and research. A bike tour, I so we're happy that she traveled all the way across the sea, and I'm, I'm very happy to introduce Sally, my mate. <laughs> Let's greet her with, okay, you guys, don't tell me practice. Ready? Good day, mate. Ready? One, two, three. Good day, mate. There you go. Uh, thanks very much for that introduction. I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's true, I have traveled a lot of them, very lucky to travel. To a number of different um, countries, a lot in Southeast Asia. Uh, but I've also been lucky enough to travel around my country, which you can see up there. Some of our uh, iconic uh, features you may recognize uh, Uluru or Air Drop, of course. You can have beaches, which is lovely. Uh, Sydney Opera House. Um, the one on the bottom right there is the Gold Coast, or Surface Paradise, which you may or may not have heard of. It's about 40, 45 minutes from Brisbane where I live. So if you do want to come on down, there's some of the key places I really recommend that you see. I'm actually from Queensland here in Brisbane, uh, on the East Coast. Uh, but I've also been lucky enough to travel over here to the States a number of times, uh, just in the last three or four years, uh, in, um, in attending conferences and presenting some of this work that uh, I'm going to present to you today. And I love coming over here to the States because Australia and the States are very similar in many ways, um, but they're also quite different in some ways. I'm always interested in um, what the differences are, particularly you know, occupational hazard around the food and different foods that you have. And so when I was um, putting this presentation together, I sort of started to think about that and do a bit of looking into that. Uh, and I did a quick, as we all do, Google search to see what um, the uh, top 50 America's favorite foods were. Uh, and I'm not sure that they consulted uh, Chef Mary when they did this, but Nonetheless, this is what came up. This is from um, the Daily Mail, which is a UK um, print media publication. I'm not quite sure if they know what your favourite foods are or not, but this is what came up in this first 15. And a lot of these are very similar to Australia. Um, beef, you know, chicken, steak, etc. I did a search and CNN um, uh, came up with these ones, very similar. Steak, number one, I think. Actually, no, it was number two. Thanksgiving dinner was number one. So a bit surprising. That is a difference. We don't have Thanksgiving, obviously, and we don't eat as much turkey as you, I don't think, either. Um, turkey comes out maybe once a year at Christmas, and then it's usually served cold because it's, you know, 35 degrees or 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which is in summer for us. Um, nachos is on there. Um, this is one, oh, my favourite, chicken wing. I do love a chicken wing. <laughs> um, this is one that we all associate with uh, the US apple pie, the US apple pie. And then um, this pantry staple, macaroni cheese. And you may be surprised to know that macaroni cheese is really only made its way into the Australian cuisine um, in the high-end market, in what I call Gucci sort of macaroni cheese in restaurants. But you can't buy this product. It's not in our supermarket shelves. Uh, so we do have some of our own, though. Um, 
this one may be familiar to you or not. That's our craft station, cancer station, uh, and we do love Vegemite food. And I often say you can tell a true Australian if they eat Vegemite, if they don't eat Vegemite. Especially in New Zealand, you know, masquerading as an Australian. I hope there are no New Zealanders in the room. <laughs> um, word of warning, if you do want to try Vegemite, please consult an Australian before you do so. There's the right way and the wrong way to eat Vegemite. And if you choose the wrong way, you'll be scarred for life. Uh, I had a friend who um, did it the wrong way uh, in, when I lived in Canada. Um, and she was said to be eating a salt lick, which I can't imagine very pleasant. Um, yes, we do eat kangaroo. Um, I have eaten kangaroo. In fact, one of my cousins went through a phase there where she substituted all her recipes with brown beef with brown um, kangaroo meat, lasagna, spaghetti, etc. Um, it's very lean. It's a bit of a diet for kids' dream. It's um, very lean, very high in iron, low in cholesterol, low in fat. You see all that jumping. Um, we also do, when we can eat, the other half of our coat of arms, the emu. We don't really eat it that much because it's a bit of a low yield animal when you um, eat the meat, but the producers do, um, uh, farmers do use it for emu oil, is quite you know, superior and medicinal. Here's one that I saw as I flew out of Brisbane Airport a couple of days ago a crocodile jerky. I'm not a jerky fan, um, and having a crocodile version of it, I don't think it would endear me to it anymore, but you like that sort of thing? What about this guy? Oh, that's bad. I usually get booed off stage. Um, he's cute, isn't he? Has anyone tried koala? <gasps> would anyone like to try koala? <gasps> I think it worse. No, we do not eat koala. <laughs> we do not eat it. It is a protective species. Uh, you can't keep them as pets, and you can't even touch them in the wild when we see them alone. Um, here's the closest thing that we do eat to it. This is uh, one of our favourite candies, chocolate, the caramella koala, and I've brought a selection of those up uh, for you. Back here at the DMA stand, if they haven't eaten them all by the time I finish, so rush back there. Uh, so please enjoy those. It doesn't get much better, does it? Sunday morning, the guys are eating the new candy. What could go wrong from here? So, on some more serious topic, though, which I really want to talk to you about today. Um, is uh, from work we've been doing at Disney, you know, my centre, the Mater Health Group, um, really probably trying to answer this question. Uh, and I think we probably all, this is one of our similarities between countries, we all probably try to answer this question. And that is, do you want to provide food, which I think we do well every day, or do you want to take this to eat? And we need to understand and recognize that those are two different things. We probably all struggle with the latter. Agree? Um, and so, but more specifically, some of the work we've done around the Convention of the Wound Service, and measuring some of our key outcome measures around this, um, and showing and demonstrating that we improve maximum improve nutritional integrity in hospitals. So this is where I'm from, this is Susan, and that's the Brisbane River. It's not always that brown, it must have had a lot of rain when this photo was taken, um, normally it looks a bit bluer than that. Um, and the Mata Health Group is, as I said, in Brisbane on the east coast here. It's seven, comprised of seven different hospital facilities, um, public and private, as Michelle said, in adult maternity and pediatric specialty. Five of which are located here in uh, central and central in city Brisbane. And then we have two others, um, one Marta Private Reverend, which is an adult facility, which is about 40 minutes um, south of our main campus. And our newest one, Marta Private Springfield, which opened in 2015, is about 40 minutes west of our campus. And so when I think about um, the challenges and drivers that face us uh, in hospital healthcare that then translate into food services, I tend to group them in these four quadrants, and this will be kind of apparent as I go through uh, my talk. And, and let me tell me if any of these sound familiar to you as well. So if I ask my our CEO or our board what were their challenges, drivers, what they're looking for from the food service model, these are some of the things that they would say. Obviously, cost containment, and I think that's global. Everyone faces budget restrictions and managing these finite budgets and resources. Patient satisfaction and patient engagement is really um, standing in mention in Australia, and I know it is good, but always, but always has been here. But we're sort of catching on to that very much so, and that's very important. We have an accreditation standard around that. And then there's the increasing clinical complexity that we're dealing with in hospitals these days, an aging population and people living longer, increasing technology, etc. Uh, evidence based practical research underpinning all our care, and that's a big move in Australia now, that um, evidence must underpin all that we do. And that we, what we do and why we do it. 
and we have our national accreditation standards. And I think you would have, I know you have that too, the presentation yesterday, which is very interesting to your accreditation standards. And they may be slightly different, but I think the same things are there. If I asked my food service team what their challenges and drivers, they would come up with one of these things. Again, they manage the budget, they hold the budget, um, and they're measuring costs for dollars per meal or ABD occupied bed days, we call it. Um, so they're interested in patient satisfaction, the quality and attention of the food, and we regularly monitor that. The challenges in mass food production, producing a lot of meals at set meal times during the day. Uh, and with our volume, we would probably produce about 2,000 meals a day. So I was saying this to someone the other day, I think in uh, the world of food, uh, healthcare, sorry, food service is probably one of the slower areas to adopt um, technology and embrace technology. You know, healthcare is very advanced in technology, but food services to me seems to be one that is, is a bit slower to adopt. And we were certainly absolutely in that category in terms of not having electronic menu management system up until about four years ago. Four years ago. Um, and they would say that their operational schedule, when they want to uh, produce food and send it out and get it to patients, doesn't really match the clinical schedule that's happening for the patient. And we've all, I mean, this sounds familiar, made food and delivered it and the patient's not in their bed or they have a care for the food, etc. And then if I ask my clinical team what they think of the challenges, they're very interested in patient satisfaction and satisfaction as well. Um, they would say there's an increase in complexity of diets, and I think that's probably common to you as well. Increase in the number of allergies and food intolerances and food avoidances, combinations of diets, etc. And with that case mix that we have, you can imagine we feed pretty much every diet there is. Um, they're very interested in menu design and the nutritional quality of a menu and having input there. They would say the reverse, that their clinical schedule and what they're trying to do with their patients doesn't match the operational schedule and the food service um, meals, etc. Uh, and malnutrition prevalence is a big one, and Michelle presented on this. Michelle and I have a lot of talks about this, um, and that's it's really um, top of mind in Australia and the prevalence. We all know that it's an issue in hospitals. That's well researched. And so we find ourselves in this uh, environment sometimes. We refer to it as the mar mission versus margin, and you kind of have this tug and this challenge between meeting all those needs and everyone, every stakeholder's needs and what's important. And sometimes that sets us up um, to be nutrition or clinical versus food services, and that's not a great place to be, and I have lived through that experience. And so if we just touch on malnutrition really quickly, I'm not going to go through it too much because Michelle spoke a bit about it the other day, but we know it's just as much to say that it's, uh, we know it's an issue, it's well recognised in the acute setting, and the prevalence, if you read the literature, can be anywhere between sort of 25 up to 80%. Um, and all the complications that go through that with that, so increased readmission rates, increased length of stay and higher treatment costs. And I've just put some references here. Michelle put a lot of the US references there, and I know many of you will be familiar with those. I just included some others that are um, from around the world. Um, that first one there is an Australian paper. The second one is a um, Swiss-German paper. Um, this one's an Australian team too, showing increased pressure injury prevalence, just to show you that it is a global problem, and there's research happening in it all around the world, uh, and you're not alone, and we're not alone in Australia. Um, increased risk of infection, increased risk of falls. This is another Australian team that did this work. Uh, and they've also shown that it's an independent risk factor for higher complications and increased mortality and length of stay and all the costs that are associated with that in hospitals. Um, and this is a Singapore paper that came out um, with some Australians on the team as well, looking at poor hospital outcome and increased costs. So we know there's plenty of literature out there that tells us this, uh, and we know it's a common problem. This is a particular study that I wanted to just quickly talk to you about, the Australasian Nutrition Care Day survey that was uh, done in 2010 and published in Clinical Nutrition in 2013. And it looked at 56 hospitals and over 3,000 patients in Australia and New Zealand. They looked at prevalence, uh, and they came up with a 32% prevalence rate in across those hospitals. And then they looked at outcome data. So again, all that data that I've just said to you, malnourished patients one and a half more times likely to die in hospital within 30 days. It's not a great outcome. 50% um, longer length of stay, greater readmission rates. Um, but what they also looked at in this paper was intake uh, in regards to malnourished and not malnourished patients. And what they found is, and I find this statistic amazing, that one in three malnourished patients eats less than 25% of the food that's presented to them. That's a lot of waste, <laughs> but that's also poor intake. And even one in five well-nourished patients eats less than 25% of the food that's presented to them. And this was one of the first studies that really looked at um, malnutrition and poor food intake and control for all the variables. Because people often say to me, oh, well, if they're malnourished, then they're really sick and they've got really bad 
disease or condition which would be affecting all those outcomes. Well, this paper actually controlled for that and found that malnutrition and poor food intake are actually independently associated, irrespective of what your disease is, associated with hospital mortality. So this is a real problem and we can do something about it. Uh, and this is another paper that came out of Australia that looked at particularly at cancer patients. They found cancer patients were 1.7 times more likely to be malnourished and have a much higher prevalence. So if you have a cancer population, which we do, this can be a real issue. And as I said, this is the bit that I was really interested in and starting to connect all the dots about intake and malnutrition and what we can do about it with our food service model. We're not alone in Nutrition Care Day Survey. It actually was based on this, the European Nutrition Day Survey. And again, this was a massive study that looked at over 16,000 patients across 25 countries, and they found that 60% of patients didn't eat a full meal. So that's pretty poor as well. And they also found those negative um, uh, outcomes from people who weren't eating and that they got worse as they ate less. This paper was really interesting, and I find it interesting to read because it also looked into reasons why people didn't eat. And the number one reason that people didn't eat was that they weren't hungry. Hmm. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Um, they also said they normally ate less, they don't like the taste, they didn't want to eat, or they had nausea, and that's a common one we hear as well. And then it went on to make recommendations, and these come out of the UK National Institute for Clinical Excellence, and some of the recommendations were fortifying food, additional snacks or sip feeds, oral supplements, ensure parental nutrition. Does that sound familiar? Anyone doing any of those? Yes? Now, as a clinician, I spent um, you know, 15 years as a clinical dietitian, uh, and my area specialty was ICU and nutrition support, and I in no way um, would say that there isn't a role for enteral and parental nutrition, and there absolutely is, and there's all the literature out there. But there's a group of patients in there who are not eating because they're not hungry or they have nausea, and they don't need enteral or parental nutrition, but we need to do something about them. And so I think these two pieces of information also help tell the story and help lead us down a possible um, path for a solution. This is just the website, um, the Nutrition Day Worldwide, and just to let you know that it is a worldwide uh, movement. It has 63 countries, and Australia and the USA are obviously in there. So everyone is focused on this, and you can get onto this website, and hospitals can subscribe and be a part of the Nutrition Care Day surveys and benchmark against other hospitals around the world. So just quickly at Marta Health, I've disclosed some of our data, uh, full disclosure. Our prevalence, we do an annual prevalence audit every year, and in fact it's happening, my staff will be doing this uh, this week while I'm here in sunny San Diego, um, uh, and we'll get our annual audit figures. But our, we've done it for about the past five years, and our prevalence is between 24 to 27%, so slightly better than the Australasian Nutrition Care Day survey, which is great, but still, you know, that's a quarter to a third of our patient population. We find the highest prevalence consistent with the literature in our oncology wards, or cancer units, we also see the highest prevalence in patients um, who are older, greater than 65 years of age, and we see a strong linear trend as age increases, that their prevalence increases. We see, again, consistent with the literature, higher prevalence in length of stay of 21 days, and as their length of stay increases, their prevalence rate increases. Um, and we also do it in um, coordination with our bedside audit that nurses do, which looks at pressure injuries. We find that 28% of our pressure injury patients are malnourished, and so there is that strong connection. And one of those studies that I put up earlier, which came out of Australia, some colleagues of mine looked and they found that if you're moderately mal malnourished, you're twice as likely to have a pressure injury, and if you're severely malnourished, you're more than four times likely to have a pressure injury. And pressure injuries have significant costs to the organisation, and they're bad for the patient. <laughs> um, and we also um, know from some of our work that I'll present to you that our patients were routinely eating less than 60% of their requirements. So consistent with all the literature. So this says to me that you know, it's not exclusive to us, we're not an anomaly, this is happening around the world. And so that's the environment we found ourselves in, in pre-2013. Again, tell me if any of this sounds familiar. Um, we had a fully manual paper-based model, we were cooked, lucky enough to be cooked fresh. Uh, we had a lot of manual recipes, we had a lot of different diets and combinations, and they weren't very well integrated into our menu. Uh, we were using a lot of what we call standard mid-meals, or snacks, supplements, etc., and fortification of foods. Um, we had the typical model where patients would fill in a paper menu, be dropped off at their bedside up to 24 hours in advance. Uh, we had little or no interaction with the patient. We'd come back and pick it up sort of the next, or 20 minutes, 30 minutes later uh, for their meal for the next day. And we had meals at set meal times. That sounds pretty standard, doesn't it? And our 
dinner meal was what I call artificial time. It was about, if you were first tray off the line, it would have been about 5.15, 5.30. And I don't know about anyone here, but I don't eat at 5.30. <laughs> uh, and so we had all the issues associated with that manual system. A lot of inefficiencies, poorly integrated menu, poor nutritional analysis of the menu, wastage of supplements. I like to refer to it as the uh, pyramid of supplements that if you go onto bedside where patients use them as building blocks and they build little pyramids and uh, so they're not drinking them, they're just playing with them and then when they go they all get, you know, thrown out into the bin. We had high plate waste because we do plate waste studies at the MARTA regularly uh, and that was about 30% and that's consistent with the literature. That's pretty common. Um, we had a lot of late meals or default meals. As I said, poor nutritional intake, and our press gainy scores weren't as good as we would have liked them to be. And so this facility that we looked um, to change initially was Marta Private Hospital. It's our adult private facility at South Brisbane, our central campus. Um, it's a reasonable sized um, hospital with three, about 300 beds and office channel operating theatres and a range of clinical services. And the solution we chose with the help of DMA was room service. Now I refer to it as room service choice on demand. I was explaining this to someone yesterday. Because in Australia, I don't know if you have this problem here, but in Australia, a lot of people say they have room service. And it's not really room service. What they mean is that they go in, it's bedside ordering, really. They go into the room and they take an order. Um, so I refer to it as room service choice on demand, even though uh, I know the common term is room service, and that's why I do that. Because it, the choice on demand, I think, is really integral to this model. Uh, and the basic premise is the right meal to the right patient at the right time. I'm not going to talk too much about room service because I know a lot of you have it, uh, but for us the main changes were firstly a significant shift in this healthcare focus uh, and the operational schedule sort of dictating to patients when they eat to more that hotel food service focus, but understanding that we're not a hotel and we're not a restaurant, we are a healthcare facility, and so we have to maintain that healthcare risk management and clinical acuity framework. The second one for us was very much a focus on patient-driven care, so a shift to customer focus service rather than the hospital giving timetable, us telling the patients, you know, when they're going to eat, etc. And with that came a much greater shift to patient engagement and participation. Um, and so a patient now with our, the room service model can't place an order without having an interaction and engagement with our call centre staff. For us, the three key points that we uh, did to operationalise room service, obviously redesign the kitchen, redesign the menu, and we have one uh, a la carte style hotel style menu, which many of you would have as well. The great challenge, as you know, to integrate diets and our clinical dietitian, our food service dietitian spent a lot of time with our exec chef working on that. And we managed to get about 97% of our diets integrated into that menu. And there was that whole redesign of the meal process. Implementation of electronic menu management system and we went out to a robust tender and our um, menu management system of choice was Seaboard that met our needs and we partnered with them. Uh, a very strong customer focus in terms of training and service delivery. Uh, and the other thing that happened uh, coincident, well, not coincidentally, but as a nice um, result of all of this, particularly for me, was there was this integrated multidisciplinary team focus on nutrition. So everyone was focused on nutrition, nursing, speech pathologists, physios, etc., because everyone had to change their practice in our process redesign. And that was a really nice um, uh, benefit of it as well for me, because it was top of mind for everyone. This is our menu, just really briefly, as I said, um, we integrated many of our diets into it. We had the usual concepts um, integrated into our menu for room service with the all-day breakfast and the build-your-own flexibility associated with that. Our hours of operation are 6.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, and from a clinical perspective, we use it as an educational tool as well. We incorporated educational symbols on it. So as you can see there, there's our build-your-own concept, our integration, uh, example of the integrated diet, the gluten-free options. That's our education symbols. This particular facility has a lot of uh, diabetics and insulin pump patients, so it's very important that they count their carbs. Uh, and so for that reason, we had a um, GI and carb counts on there. Uh, and even our fluid diets, our restricted diets, can choose off this menu. It was integrated for them. And so as I said really quickly, our hours of operation 6.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. I won't go through room service because you all know it. Um, and we use the seaboard tray tracker software to track trays through to um, keep track of where they are at all times. And so here's my quadrants again. And so when we implemented, we were in really interested in um, measuring the outcomes associated with that. Did we make a difference? Did it make any difference to some of the key things and problems that we were having? Uh, and we knew, we looked in the literature, we knew there was some documented literature around financial benefits of it and cost savings. 
and some uh, documentation around uh, literature around patient experience, people who reported improved post-gainer scores, etc. But I was a little bit interested in some of the other outcomes as well. You know, were there any system integration um, and process efficiencies that we gained from it? And also, particularly, my of interest the clinical care and outcomes. So, particularly around nutritional intake, patient safety, etc. And so when we started to map this out um, and we looked at our process redesign, we also found that we um, had a lot of evidence for our um, accreditation standards uh, and particularly around consumer engagement, which is standard two in Australia. Uh, patient identification, we introduced the three identifier checks for meal orders and meal delivery, which is standard five in Australia. Uh, and also there's uh, standard 12, which is around the nutrition. And then when I put it all together in this sort of framework, I found it connected quite nicely to our organisation strategy plan, and these are some of the key drivers in our organisation strategy plan, and I did that to help it make sense to a lot of our executive and our CEO, that they're the things at the top of their mind. If I can connect some of our outcomes to that, then it really resonates with them. So what did we find? What we ended up with is measuring these four um, key measures, and we put it all together, and we now turn this data through the Nutrition Balance Scorecard. So for those of you familiar with the Balance Scorecard, Methodology, yes, it came out of Harvard um, Business Review, Kaplan and Norton back in the early 90s. And the idea is that there are key um, drivers of an organisation. Uh, there's not just one driver, not just financial or not just patient satisfaction. There are key drivers uh, and they're all equally important and you should really keep your eye on all of them. And so these are the four that we measured uh, in terms of our um, outcomes. So first one, um, we saw a reduction in patient food costs, and we've seen that documented in the literature with other sites. For us, it was about 15 to 20 percent. Um, for us, we were FT or staff neutral because there was a move from a lot of delivery staff. We had, um, I think it amuses uh, Stu and um, Michelle that we had a tea trolley. I'm not sure if you have tea trolleys here. More, we call it morning tea, afternoon tea, and supper. Um, very British, I know. Um, so you call it snacks, and so we'd have this tea trolley that went around three times a day and just handed out food that the dietitians had ordered that patients then stacked up in their pyramid, um, and then it went wasted. So we, that went out the window, we didn't have that anymore, so we directed that staff into more cook and chef. Uh, meal, incorrect meals or default meals, as you know with this model, there are no default meals, the patient only orders what they want when they want it. Uh, one of the areas of um, savings is particularly in plate waste, and as I said, we do plate waste studies, so I'm not sure if people are familiar with you know, doing plate waste studies, uh, but we did this study, we used a five-point visual analysis tool here, we also did a semi-structured interview looking at reasons for waste, um, and this is what we found here. So this is our overall hospital plate waste, so that's moving from pre-2013 and post time one and time two. I did time two because I didn't believe time one results, <laughs> I said that can't be right. 11% or 12%. I said, I've never seen a plate waste that low, and so I made them repeat it. Uh, and it actually went down a little bit more. It went down to around 11.8%, I think. Uh, but what was really interesting for me, too, was that we saw the greatest um, reduction in plate waste in these two units, which are our surgical and our oncology population. And that 6% is in our oncology population. With the clinicians in the room who work with these patients, you know they're a very difficult patient population to feed because of all their complications and their symptoms, etc. So I think that's a, I've never seen a plate waste that low in any of the literature that I've searched. Uh, the other thing is interesting, we look at reasons for waste, as I said, um, and we've written this up as a paper. Um, the first thing to note between the traditional model and room service is there's about a third the number of reasons for waste, and that's indicative of how um, much less waste there is in patients who wasted food. But the other thing I think is really important is here, the next, um, biggest reason for waste for the room service one is around the actual food, so the appearance, the texture, that sort of thing. It's not about them feeling nauseous or unwell. Whereas the next uh, most common reason in the traditional tray line model uh, was those sorts of nausea, unwell, etc. So that starts to tell us what's happening. And the other thing is these other reasons for waste that we saw in the traditional model, default meals, inadequate menu, or the eating time frames ordering in advance, just didn't appear, obviously, in the room service model. So the second uh, uh, quadrant we looked at on our scorecard was patient satisfaction. We saw improved press gaining scores. We do press gaining in Australia, but there's press gaining Australia, which is a separate um, group. So we benchmark against our peers in Australia. Uh, and this comes from, obviously, better menu integration, better flexibility, greater patient engagement and interaction. And that obvious one, again, no default meal. So a patient doesn't get a meal that they didn't order. 
And this is what we saw. These are some of the key measures from our press gaming. So you can see we went from the sort of 60 centiles up to the high 80s, up to the that flavor of food, 99th centile. So we saw a massive increase in our press gaming scores. And that was a nice linear trend we measured over quarters. And that's where we put room service in there in quarter three, 2013. And we've seen a steady increase ever since. Our third quarter here was system integration and efficiencies. As I said, there's natural efficiencies to be gained when you go from a manual to an electronic process. Um, but also in our system redesign, when we mapped it, we started to find that we had greater patient safety measures and uh, evidence for our national standards, like patient identification, consumer engagement, et cetera. So our quality team, which runs our accreditation survey preparation, were extremely happy to hear from us for more evidence. And the other thing it did is really embed nutrition in the multidisciplinary team. As I said, everyone was talking about nutrition. Everyone became a bit more aware about it. These are our national accreditation standards, and you don't have to be able to see these. Suffice to say that there are 10 compulsory standards. Standard 2 is about consumer engagement, and standard 5 is about patient identification. Uh, and then standard 12 is another 5, um, which are not mandatory yet, but it will be worked into being mandatory in the coming years. Uh, and there's one a provision of care which says that the organisation will meet the nutritional needs of consumers and patients. And I'm sure you all have similar accreditation standards um, with similar themes. And the fourth quadrant, clinical outcomes, my particular area of interest. Um, again, NIL's default meal, so increased patient safety, much more greater improvement of, of uh, management of allergies and intolerances. One could argue if patient satisfaction goes up, that nutritional intake should go up, do you think? Um, and in fact, that's what we saw. So again, we measured um, using the five-point visual analysis tool plus photographic data. This is a very labour-intensive um, process, if anyone's done this. Uh, so I understand why there's not a lot of literature out there on nutritional intake, because it does take a lot of time. Um, and we measured their total intake, but also as an estimated portion of their requirements. And we measured it by cohort, because I was quite interested to see what happened with the different cohorts. We've got three main cohorts, medical, surgical, and oncology in this facility. And so this is what we saw. This is our uh, their energy intake. So again, moving from left to right there, the pale blue is the traditional model tray line. Um, the next one is room service, choice on demand. And then the final uh, column there is their estimated energy requirements. So that's how it compares to their requirements. And we saw a statistical significant increase in their actual intake of energy. And we saw the same thing here, protein. Statistically significant increase in their protein intake. Not meeting their total requirements still, uh, that's a big ask, I think, to get patients to eat their, meet their total requirements in hospital, given everything that's happening, but that's certainly, I think, what we should be aiming for. And then, as a clinician, we're obviously interested not just in the total amount that they're taking in, but what, how they're meeting their estimated requirements as a percent. So you can see, with both energy and protein, we saw a statistically significant increase in both energy and protein in terms of meeting their a percent of their requirements. Again, not up to 100%, but getting, uh, getting up there. And I was particularly interested, as I said, looking at per cohort. Which, was there a cohort that it worked better in or that it was more effective in? And this is what we saw. So split by medical, surgical and oncology. We saw the greatest increase in medical and oncology in terms of um, energy intake per day. Medical reached statistical significance. The oncology one looks like it should have, but we just didn't have the numbers. You can see N equals 10 and 18 in our pre-post groups. So that's uh, quite small. We just didn't have the numbers. So we're trying to repeat those studies um, now with another piece of work to try and get those numbers up to prove that statistical significance. And the same we saw in protein there. So we saw an increase. And again, that's a great achievement in the oncology population. You have higher than normal requirements, but usually lower than normal intake. And protein, uh, sorry, and medical reach statistical significance. Again, as a percent of requirements, it's just another way of looking at the data. I'm a bit of a data person. I apologise for those in the room who aren't data people. My food service manager calls me the data queen. And he doesn't say it in a complimentary way. Um, but I say to him very often, you're loving me now, aren't you? Because this is really <laughs> proving your case. So uh, I find him quoting the data every now and then. Again, we saw statistically significant in the medical population. An increase, it looks like it should be statistically significant for oncology, but probably didn't have the numbers and the same for protein as a percent of requirements by cohort. Still quite low for oncology, that's indicative of how hard it is to really meet the oncology patient population's requirements. I was also particularly interested to see what would happen when patients were left to order for themselves. And when I present this work in Australia, I usually get two um, uh, pieces of feedback. And one comes from the clinicians, 
you know, say we, we couldn't possibly introduce you know, room service because people won't eat, patients won't order and they won't eat and they'll starve. And then the other end um, is from usually food service. They say we couldn't introduce room service, we couldn't possibly do that. Patients will order all the time, they'll order you know, six, seven times a day, and our budget will blow out and it won't work. And what actually happens is somewhere in the middle. Um, and so this is that we track the meal ordering pattern, this is percent of patients ordering, and you can see most patients will order. Uh, we did it in t two time points, uh, post room service, just to, again, double check the data. Most patients will order the three main meals, and then, sorry, down the bottom, morning tea, afternoon tea, and supper, that's our British therapy, is snacks there, um, mid meal snacks. And what I found really interesting was this one here, what we call uh, sup oh, sorry, supper, sorry, supper or the evening snack, went right down. So the number of people that were ordering that was really low. And I think time two there, that equated to about two people. And so previously what we were doing with our tea trolley, going around three times a day and delivering these snacks, which would just sit on patients' bedside and then get thrown out. Uh, and that tells us that patients didn't want that evening snack. Part of that is due to the extended um, ordering hours for room service, so they could now order much later. So we changed that artificial meal time so they didn't really need an evening snack as well. But the other thing I was interested in was to see, um, of those who did it, where did their energy and protein come from? And so this is mapping where they get their energy intake by meal. So you can see, again, most of their energy comes from their main meals, breakfast, particularly uh, at dinner there. Uh, and they are getting um, some, you know, a significant portion of intake from their mid-meal snacks, and particularly that supper one or that evening one. So even though very few people are ordering it, those that are ordering it are getting a fair, you know, whack of their daily calories and protein from it. So we shouldn't discount it. And that just helps us look at what sort of items they're ordering at that time and making sure that they're of high nutritional quality. Same with protein, as you can see. So even though only one or two patients ordered that um, evening snack there, it's giving them a, you know, from a clinician's point of view, 10 grams of protein is a fair dose. That's pretty good, particularly when they're not eating very well. Uh, we've just implemented the newest module of Seaboard, which uh, is mobile intake. Now we put that in November 2016 and we're just about to repeat some of our nutritional intake studies using this and this will revolutionise our data collection because this is one of the big barriers uh, for clinicians is the data collection and how long it takes and it's a very manual process. Whereas this will make it all electronic and will document intake as trays are collected. It uses a mo mobile tablet device or we use iPads and it will measure, the beauty of it is we'll measure both nutritional intake and plate weight which are essentially inverse measures of each other. So for the clinicians, the nutritional intake is very important the food service are very interested in plate waste. So it'll give us that real-time data for both areas really quickly. Uh, and um, we can measure nutrient intake uh, contribution by meal or by day or by series of days, whatever the clinician's looking for. This is a screenshot of what it looks like here. Um, so you, as a clinician, you um, target which patient, identify which patients you want to have it monitored, their intake monitored. And then when they come to collect the tray, this is what they see. Everything that they've ordered it automatically comes up. So there's no photographing of meals or anything like that anymore. And then they simply select off, the same way we do with a, the visual, five-point visual analysis tool, they select off how much they had, either the whole tray or below the line here per item. And that way it automatically calculates protein and calories uh, for us. They can also document reasons for waste down here, which I believe is really important. It's important we understand why people aren't eating certain things. And they can document that down there. And so if we put it all together in our balanced scorecard, this is essentially what we found. And I've presented this several times, and my CEO has seen this presentation, and as he refers to it, it ticks all boxes. Uh, and it literally does. But not only that, it really gave us a lot more um, data, real-time data, to improve our decision-making. And it gave us a lot of um, evidence for risk minimization for the patient, improved monitoring, um, accreditation, um, evidence, etc. And the other thing that I always say when I present this work is that it's important to understand that all of these are interrelated and we're not one in isolation of the other. So, for example, if patient's satisfaction goes up, their nutritional intake goes up, our plate waste goes down, our food costs go down. And so they're all interrelated and I think it's really important to understand, if we go back to my first slide, the drivers that each stakeholder has um, uh, and what they're looking for, but they all, they all rely on each other and they all need to be considered in equal importance. And so our key learnings, um, patients know what they want and when they want it. It's not rocket science, I say to people. My, um, my, one of my, I have two brothers. My older brother argues with, with me about nutrition all the time. Uh, I think he forgets what it is that I do, but anyway. Um, and he said, rang me before I left, and he said, um, 
well, have a good trip and hope it goes well. He said, it's amazing, isn't it? He spent a number of years working in hotels and restaurants. He said, it's amazing that healthcare's just cottoned on to what hotels have been doing for, you know, 40 years. But yes, we are slightly slow to adopt, but it's a simple concept and I think we need to, you know, really think about it. And perhaps this reflects really the increasing role of consumers in their healthcare decisions. And that's a big movement these days too, that participatory medicine idea. And maybe our role in all of this really is just to provide a safe and clinically appropriate framework and environment to assist them to do this. Our other big key learning, when I sort of mapped it out, was that there are key points in the food service process that we can manipulate to enhance our outcomes. And the uh, use of electronic menu management system and the process redesign can really um, integrate nutritional requirements and intake monitoring into daily clinical care, and that's where we should be headed. So if I just touch on those key points, the food service process, the points that we manipulated, when I put all this down and we looked at all our outcomes and I thought, you know, what is it that we did that made the difference? And it's a bit hard in this particular uh, example and study because I like to refer to it as the Big Bang. <laughs> when I refer to it, we went from, you know, nothing to what I would consider the gold standard. But I mapped it out and I thought these are the four key things that we really changed. We changed the menu content and the quality and the room service menu allows that flexibility and that build your own concept, etc. We changed the meal order timing, so when we take the meal order, much closer to the meal time. We changed the meal order interaction, we actually spoke to the patients, we engaged them, we used that as an educational um, point in the process as well. And we changed the meal delivery, the meal timing, to a time when, hmm, they actually would like to eat it. And so then I started to map these out and, and try to connect which ones made the difference to which outcomes, which is a bit of a, um, uh, hypothetical, you know, because we didn't change them in a staged process. But I think you can certainly, if we look at um, uh, and the key outcomes that they uh, gave us, I think if you look at um, nutritional, you can certainly influence the nutritional quality by adjusting the menu and having a high quality menu and involving the clinical dietitians in that regard. Um, probably the interaction, you can sort of coerce people a bit and, and try to encourage them and, and give them education in terms of their good choices and their higher nutritional quality choices. But I think it's probably this one that makes the most difference to nutritional intake, actually feeding people when they want to eat. Uh, and if we go back to the barriers to nutritional intake, the patient perspective, and I'll refer to the two, um, one of the pieces of literature I referred to earlier, which is the uh, European Nutrition Care Day Survey, remember the reasons that they mentioned, not hungry, normally eat less, don't want to eat, nausea. Our reasons that we found in our um, implementation satiated or feeling full, discomfort, nausea, unwell, etc. That's what patients are telling us, the reasons they're not eating. This is a study, I put this in, this is a study, again, out of Australia, um, from colleagues of mine uh, who published in Nutrition and Dietetics, our Australian journal, looking at the barriers and priorities from a stakeholder perspective. And this is what I find really interesting. So you won't be able to read all that, and that's okay. But suffice to say, they looked at three key stakeholder groups, dietitians, food service managers, and nurse uh, unit managers. And if we look at the top five reasons that those stakeholders said um, there were the barriers to patients eating, uh, it was lack of assistance, um, lack of flexibility, um, length of stay and boredom, limited variety, same with the food service managers, um, length of stay, lack of feeding assistance. They just kept saying feeding assistance, you know, they need more assistance, etc. And then when they asked them what was the, so their solution to uh, poor nutrition intake, again, three key groups of stakeholders, if you look at the top five reasons that they all gave, again, a lot of similarities. Fortification, um, additional snacks, all those same things that we think will solve the problem. And these are a couple of studies that just uh, came out recently. Austin is our um, version of Aspen, you're of Aspen, so it's the Australasian Society for Parental and Oriental Nutrition, which I presented this work at as well. Um, protected meal times, I'm not sure that that's a movement here, is it? Protected meal times, it's a movement in Australia as one of the solutions, and the idea is that you still have the set meal times, but you protect them so patients aren't interrupted and no one can go in and talk to them when the meal is delivered. And, you know, as you can imagine, that certainly works in the hospital environment. Uh, not. Um, and this was a study done uh, by Judy Porter, who's a colleague of mine, and she actually did a meta-analysis and review of all the literature out there, and it found two things. One I find interesting that only really seven met the criteria for a meta-analysis, and that tells me that there's not a lot of literature out there and there's not a lot of research happening in this space. 
and only three were original research papers, but she found that there was no statistical significance and insufficient evidence for this as a uh, strategy to improve patient's intake. So I say forget protected neophytes. Um, this second one was uh, by another colleague from Monash, uh, Georgia Collins, uh, and again, the solutions they put in place were a high energy menu um, and snacks and supplements, greater patient interaction, etc. Again, they found some improved intake, but it wasn't statistically significant. So I say to people, I think you're barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> the solution is not that hard. Uh, and so I would say, you know, if we look at the reasons that patients are telling us that, um, now it's going to all come in, uh, that they're not eating, and we look at the recommendations that are coming out, are they really the solutions? Is it really the solution to fortify food and send additional snacks, to high energy menu or protect meal times, or should we just provide, uh, have a provision of high quality, a wide range of high quality foods at a time that patients feel like it, which is the safest choice on demand. And so our future, we've just put uh, room service in, because we were um, so successful in our first implementation in 2013, and because we documented all those outcomes, and as I said, we presented it, and my CEO saw it for the first time and said, oh, ticks all the boxes. They came back to him and said, we'd like a business case for the rest of our facilities, both public and private facilities. Um, and which we did, and we implemented in those facilities uh, late last year, 2016. And so now we have a nice cohort, uh, group of room service, uh, sorry, room service model across a nice group of patients, public, private, maternity, paediatrics, adults, and I think that covers the whole gamut. So we'll be able to do a lot of research really looking at all the different um, cohorts and see whether it's better in certain cohorts or not. Um, We'll continue to do our routine outcome measurement, and I stress this to dietitians in Australia all the time. You, know, you must measure outcomes because it gives you the evidence uh, to prove um, your business case, not only your business case, return on investment, but also really guides that evidence-based practice. Uh, we'll use mobile intake, which will revolutionise our data collection, particularly for nutritional intake. Um, we'll continue to measure a balanced scorecard approach because I think that's really important. Um, that we respect all the stakeholders' uh, views and all their drivers. Uh, and I think back to um, our previous CEO, one of the mottos uh, from the MARTA is to put the patient first. And I think if we're all focused on putting the patient first, and I think that ties in quite nicely with the theme of servant leadership here, then we can't go wrong. If we're all thinking about putting the patient first and we're all working on our individual area, then uh, we'll all work um, in that balanced scorecard approach. And I guess the ultimate is to have evidence-based food service models. This is not an area that's particularly evidence-based or evidence-driven, as it is in the clinical world, and anything we do clinically needs to be evidence-based um, and really focused on that, and so we'll be looking at evidence-based food service models and continuing our research into uh, solutions for improving nutritional intake and hopefully uh, reducing the malnutrition risk and prevalence. And I guess really asking the questions, are food service models really um, should they be considered as a primary clinical treatment for malnutrition risk? And I just want to finish with this really nice quote. This comes out of um, a European study. It really says, in summary, really, malnutrition might be one of the most important factors that interferes with health and disease in our hospital setting. And the best uh, decision is to treat the disease and nourish the patient. And it's fundamental to understand the significant role nutritional therapy plays in improving the outcome of those who cannot or may not eat during their disease process and start to think of it similarly to um, what hemodialysis represents for patients with renal failure or ventilatory support represents for those with respiratory failure. It's that serious. And so I'm going to change the title of my uh, presentation to um, do you want to provide food or do you want patients to eat room service? Is it a new clinical treatment for malnutrition risk? And I'll leave you with that thought. I just wanted to acknowledge um, all the team. Obviously nothing great happens solo. It's all a team effort. Uh, my nutrition and dietetics clinical team, food services team, but also our partners in this journey, DMA, have been great, uh, and Seaboard, the Asia Pacific Division, have also been fantastic. Uh, and we couldn't have had any of our data collection without our university students um, from our two universities that we partner with. And I encourage you to use them as a workforce to help me get this data to be interested in doing. Thank you.